the world's, the world's writers will walk through those gates. And uh, if you hang around, you get a chance to talk to them. I'm interested in conversations that deal with things that matter, that real, you know, how do we live our lives? First of all, make climate change personal in your life. The second step is get angry and get active. And the third step, and believe it or not, I think this is the most important. We have to imagine this world that we want to hurry towards. But kindness is looking at people as people and not as I voted this, I do this, whatever it is. There are some people we will never get along with, but most of us, most of us are a complex mass of different things. My name is Raja Shahadi. I've been participating in the Edinburgh International Book Festival for many years. The festival has been central to my development as a writer. The thrill I feel as I enter Charlotte Square has never waned. I could always count on excellent programming and stimulating discussions. There has never been a time when such meetings are more important. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Edinburgh International Book Festival. My name is Whitney Richardson. I'm the Global Events Manager at the New York Times, and I'm so happy to be here. I'm also former photo editor for the, the newspaper um, and a contributing writer where I focused on uh, specifically contemporary African photography. Um, I'm, I'm proud to say that this year, the New York Times is also uh, a media partner for the book festival for the second year running, and we're excited to, to be here with you today. It's an honor um, to also be here with you with the incredible Echo Eshun, who's a writer, a curator, a broadcaster, and also the former director of the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London, who recently curated an exhibition of contemporary photography called Africa State of Mind. This year, Echo also released a new book with the same name, Africa State of Mind, I have right here with me, which we'll be discussing today. Um, it serves as a visual anthology of contemporary African photography across the diaspora, highlighting some of my favorite photographers, including Gurma Berta in Ethiopia, Yagazi Amezi in Nigeria, as well as Andrew Esiebo in Nigeria, Zanelli Maholi in South Africa, just to name a few. Um, and I also learned a, a lot of new photographers who I, weren't, I wasn't familiar with in this book as well. Um, so just so excited to welcome Echo. Hello. Hey, Whitney, how are you? I'm, I'm doing so well. Um, it's unfortunate that we couldn't be together yeah. in Scotland this year. Um, it would have been so great to be sitting on a stage with you to have this conversation. But the beautiful thing is we can talk to a broader audience um, yeah. with these tools. Exactly, and we can do that now. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So congratulations on the book. Um, let's just jump right into the discussion. Um, you know, we, we all know that Africa is home to more than 1.2 billion people. It's the second most populous continent um, in the world. Um, and from your point of view, 
gaining a better understanding of the landscape not isn't just about thinking about the geography, um, but it's also about looking inwards um, to the mindset of the people who live there. Yeah. Um, this, this book is not just about art, right? This is political. Um, as I understand it, your family's from Ghana as well, yeah. though you were raised in London. Yeah. Um, what did this book mean for you personally and, and why did you decide to, to put it together? I think if you, you know, like you said, my, you know, my family comes from Ghana. They came to Britain. They came to London in the early 60s. My parents did. Um, and I actually lived for a few years as a small child in Ghana. And I think, but I think if you grow up in Britain, you're very conscious of the ways that Africa as a continent and as an idea are addressed in the popular imagination. And inevitably, that means this kind of curious way of thinking about Africa as if it's perpetually stuck in a past, as if it's still quote unquote heart of darkness, as if it's still somehow this pre-modern space. Um, you know, in the 19th century, all sorts of political thinkers and philosophers like Hegel uh, evoked these idea of Africa as somehow this place outside history. And I think some of those tropes, some of those imaginaries of Africa are still some sort of prime, are still a place in some sort of primordial past, still remain. And I remember some of that from when I was growing up as a yeah. child, from when people talked to me about their idea of Africa as this place where people carry spears and live in huts and so on. Yeah, even today you see kind of charity images and telethon type images and live aid type images of starving African babies and white saviors and all of these things. All of these things still exist very much in the popular imagination. Movies like Congo, movies like Jumanji, you know, movies like Kong, Skull Island, all of these things still have this idea that Africa somehow exists outside sophistication, outside cosmopolitanism, outside modernity uh, and I wanted to have a conversation that began from another place which mm. is that Africa is deeply embedded in the cosmopolitan is couldn't couldn't not be so because its history and the history of the countries uh, within Africa have been about trading and exchange of ideas on commerce and all sorts of things for millennia um and when you begin from that basis then you can also look at how photography has played a role both in reinforcing some of those uh stereotypes that i've been talking about but also in confounding those and moving beyond those so i wanted to um uh the idea for the book africa's date of mind was to look at Africa through the eyes of African photographers rather than through the eyes of a colonial imagery. Uh, let's, talk about, let's dig into that colonial imagery. Yeah. Uh, you opened the book really focusing on the history of photography in Africa and yeah. how it was actually used as one of the tactics for colonialism. Um, yeah. And it was quite an effective tactic. Uh, the same tactic was used also in the States when we were thinking about slavery and, and just how people uh, used imagery to um, confirm why slavery was uh, necessary and appropriate. Um, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about what that meant in Africa, um, the time frame in which photography started and how it was used as a way to, to set those early images that people have, uh, keep, have, have resonated in their mind uh, for generations. Well, I mean, look, um, photography is invented, roughly speaking, around the, the mid 19th century. Uh, and this is the same time that um, that the uh, the European uh, powers essentially start to uh, enact a project of colonialism in Africa. So before that, obviously, you have some hundreds of years of slavery. Uh, but uh, the colonial project starts around mid 19th century when Af when European powers essentially divide up Africa in the so-called scramble for Africa and designate different countries. Belgium takes the Congo and so on. Uh, Britain takes uh, the Gold Coast and Nigeria and, and so on and so on. Um, with that, at the same time as that colonial project, photography is uh, invented and photography becomes a tool to reinforce uh, 
the vision and values of colonialism in uh, in the Western imagination anyway. So, you know, for a long period of time, we have the, the visual representation of, of Africa in the West is comes through photography. And it comes through photographs that reinforce those messages, photographs of people apparently in their natural habitats. These uh, fake ethnographic images of African peoples, which are both exotic and eroticized images very often as well. Um, and these aren't minor images. There's actually, there's, there's kind of very interesting kind of sub story really about uh, the role of, 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 of postcards. There are hundreds of millions of postcards, of, of picture postcards that are produced kind of uh, in Europe and America in the latter part of the 19th century and into the early 20th century. Many, many of those uh, are, are of African imagery. Many of those situate African people always in the bush, always, well not always, but often semi-naked, often in the situation where again, they're seen as somehow representative of this, uh, of this underdeveloped, under-modern state. And so they're, primitiveness is always contrasted with European sophistication and the idea underlying that is this, is this idea that, that, uh, that the colonial project brings civilization, brings order, brings progress to Africa and without that Africans would be perpetually sunk in the past. Um, we have an image up on the screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so we get into the 60s and 70s. So we we, we understand that, um, you know, imagery and photography and visuals were used as a tactic for colonization. But then as the 60s and 70s roll around, you know, there, there are people across the continent that begin using photography to claim ownership of their own narrative. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so talk to me through who some of those newer photographers were in the 60s and 70s. They were working in studios. They were in the middle of their cities. What what did that look like? And, well, and I mean, so so the crucial thing is, so, yeah, I can talk about that, that, uh, that colonial gaze. But the thing is, even from those very early days, from the late 19th century onwards, African photographers in Africa are taking photos of African people with a much different uh, sensibility and so on. And this that accelerates in the post-war period in the 1960s uh, and in the 1970s when African countries uh, secure their independence from colonial rule. So certainly from the from from 19 from from the 1960s onwards, you get this uh, wave of photographers who, like you say, are working in their studios and showing Africans in a much different light. Uh, the quintessence of that almost is Malik Sidibe, the great yep. Malian uh, studio portrait photographer, who creates these fantastic, and which we see one of his uh, images on screen right now. Who this is one of his more prominent images that you know many people know of his work because yeah, yeah. it's just so beautiful to see post independence people freely dancing and enjoying their lives, um, and not as this image of people in bushes as the world had once known, right? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So this is Bamako, the capital of Mali in, um, in the early 60s. People at nightclubs, dressed elegantly, dancing. Uh, and it, Malik Sidibe is the master of evoking this exuberant post-independence period when everything seems possible. When uh, people are young, people are out, people are having a good time the future seems to be unfolding. Simultaneous to that, we can look at a photographer like Samuel Fosso, who's such a fantastic, yeah. Samuel Fosso, one of my, <laughs> the all time, the all, the all time greats. So Samuel Fosso is really, you know, he's such a, such a sort of fascinating story because he, um, um, at this point, Samuel Fosso is probably, he's, he is a teenager in the 1970s in the, uh, DRC, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Actually, is that, is that where he is? Um, he's a teenager with his own photo studio. Um, and he takes conventional photos during the daytime, but at night, um, he takes these series of self-portraits. These self-portraits where he dresses up in front of a camera and stages these fantastic um, self-portraits where 
he's kind of thinking aloud really about how you represent yourself as an African man, how you think about your place in the world, how you also think about the influence of music, of style, culture, of how you articulate ideas of gender, how um, just basically how you play with self-representation. And he does that. And I, you know, his photos are so fascinating because he created this whole series of photos across the mid seventies, which he had no intention of showing to the public. They get discovered in the much later in life. And then, you know, he turns into something of a sensation as a photographer, but again, these absolutely give the, give the lie to an idea that, um, that Africa or that, uh, that what we see of Africa somehow belong, you know, is about the bush or is about something in the past. He's absolutely thinking about, thinking actively and thinking visually the entire time about the aesthetic possibilities of self-representation. And, you know, it's interesting when I see his work um, and he was based in Carr, uh, he's Cameroonian, but uh, moved to Carr to do his work and build his studio is that he really, it, it gives me this sense of like uh, the selfie, the, the of Instagram yeah. culture, where like people set up and really think yeah. about their backdrops and, and what they're looking like. Yeah. Um, but he was doing that before we had Instagram and Snapchat and TikTok, right? Like he yeah. was creating a, a space where people could show up, show off their fashion and, and be their best selves. Yeah. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And if we look at this image, for instance, the thing about it is so playful, and like you say, Whitney, it's so constructed as well. Because look, the camera, the camera is actually pulled back so that we can see even the lights. You know, he made his own lights out of saucepan, you know, saucepans, and like they're kind of they're, they're deliberately they're, well, they're quite crude lights, but we see the studio setup. So it's not a naturalistic photo. It's not an authentic photo and then this is about him playing, this is about him performing in front of the camera. And I think the parallel with, with self is absolutely, you know, is, is absolutely relevant. You know, this is what you do. This is what you can do in front of a camera. So this isn't about saying this is Samuel Fosso. This is a version of Samuel Fosso. Right. And I think also gets to, we could, that this is a perfect segue into thinking through the, the, the chapters of your book and how you've broken up each into certain uh, to categories, um, thinking through the ownership part of the way that a person is presented and, and how um, photography is such a powerful tool to reclaim the narrative uh, in which you want people to see, right? Like we have in, in this day and age, um, I think part of the reason why, uh, you know, through globalization, people are starting to see Africa in a different light is because people are now, contemporary photographers are now owning that narrative yeah. and sharing it on these social media platforms. Uh, a lot of the photographers that you've outlined are using, using these tools and that's how I've, I've learned about their work. Yeah. Um, and so let's, let's get into contemporary, the contemporary world. When we say contemporary African photography, uh, what, um, what year, like what years were you looking at when you organized this book? Um, how did you find the photographers? What were you thinking about? Um, let, let's talk about your thought process for contemporary. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, I mean, a couple of things. I mean, one, I think almost, almost all of the photographs in the book are shot in the last decade, are shot in the 2010s. I wanted recent work mm -hmm. that allowed us to take something of a snapshot of how uh, African photographers are seeing Africa as close to now as possible. Um, and what, what, one thing, I was struck by how much work there is, how many, you know, you'll know this, look, how many photographers are working in this territory and how much, how rich and nuanced that work is. And I wanted to find some ways to kind of capture that and bring that together and bring that to light. And, you know, when you set off a project like this, it turns into something of an, obsess of an obsession. So for about a year, I was obsessed with looking, at, I mean, for more than that, even in advance, but once I got into the book, I was obsessed with um, trying to discover as many different photographers as possible. And what happens with that is that you look at a lot of work you reject a lot of work as well. 
I was trying to find I was trying to find photographers whose work I think for me uh, bridges this gap between sometimes reportage, uh, sometimes thinking aloud, but always really um, uh, I think a reaching towards art, which is to say a reaching towards their own personal articulation of place, of memory, of sensibility, of history, of politics, of any of these things. I'm interested in photographers who, um, well, actually, look, I'm really, I'm really interested in photographers who aren't interested in authenticity, in fact. I'm mm. really interested in photographers who aren't interested in saying, look, this is, this is the world, objectively so. I'm interested in photographers who were trying to capture the world from their own singular point of view, rather than, um, rather than uh, a kind of scientific, objective documentary mm. approach. You know, I think this comes down to um, uh, the title of the book. You know, the book's called Africa State of Mind. And what I was conscious of is that there isn't a singular take on what Africa looks like. Or no, there's there's like. absolutely no way. <laughs> exactly, exactly. They can't not be. By contrast, I think why I stress that is because that sets of the, those sets of colonial imagery that I was talking about earlier always used to insist that these were somehow ethnographic or anthropological or scientific truths about, you know, to, to kind of authentic Africa. So Africa's state of mind really is about uh, Africa as a state of imaginary. Africa is a state of possibility. Africa seen through the eyes of a myriad. There's over 50 photographers in the book, through the eyes of all of these different photographers who, and collectively perhaps, one comes to a kind of kaleidoscopic, a uh, mosaic type uh, impression of Africa as a whole, but I'm not interested in saying this is Africa. I'm interested in saying this is Africa through the point of views of one or other photographer. And through that, let's try and come to some sort of sense of just the multiple ways we can read the territory and read the people there. Um, I mean, just- it's, a big, it, it's definitely a big undertaking, I will, have to admit, I can't imagine, uh, you know, that level of work. That I'm sure you were overwhelmed at some points because the amount of people now that are able to take photographs because technology has just become a lot easier for someone to have yeah. a, a camera, a cell phone, even Gurma Berta, his work in Ethiopia was taken yeah. specifically on his cell phone, um, you know, so so I can't imagine how overwhelming that that that, that yeah. process was for you. Yeah, I tell you, it was a process. It was, I mean, to some extent, it was exhilarating in another way, it's agonizing as well. <laughs> because, well, just because, you know, this is the finite limit to how much you can do also deadlines, which means that as soon as I close the book, I discover all sorts of other photographers that I could have. So I live now just in this like perpetual uh, regret. Now, that I there's, this a person or that person. there's a book too that's coming. I can feel it. There's a part two of this. Uh, and I, you know, I feel it coming um, yeah. from you. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, the thing is, because how, how, how do you draw a line with this because yeah. look, we're in a moment of, I think of extraordinary visual uh, richness and fertility in terms of African photography and I don't look I mean tell me I mean look from your position in New York Times is that you know is that something that's just a kind of fantasy or, or kind of wish of mine what I mean what do you know you're absolutely spot on um, and I think what has happened is is that people are now open to the idea of even exploring uh, who's on the ground and making work. So from my perspective, um, from working in the news, I'm always curious as to who's telling the stories of the locations that the stories are being told, right? And that goes back to owning, having an ownership of narrative, um, making sure that from a news perspective, we're not just sending photographers into the region and then they fly out after two days, yeah. but like, are we also looking at photographers that are on the ground that maybe just need a little bit more understanding as to the, um, the ethics of news journalism, as opposed to like artistic wedding photography. Um, and just, you know, how do we, how do we continue to work with 
and nurture photographers that are doing excellent work on the ground and give them the opportunity to share their own stories from a news perspective. Um, and I think that those questions are now being asked. Um, I think people are now being challenged and news organizations, magazines, um, you know, books, we're, at, we're, we're now being uh, more thoughtful about who's owning, owning stories. And I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, organizations are being challenged uh, you know, to see who's, who's, who's behind writing that. So who's the author, who's the photographer, who's the director, you know, and, and this is, and this is happening now. And I think it's, I think it's a wonderful, I think it's a wonderful thing. Um, but before we, before we go on with that, because that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother category. And I want to see some of this work because this is a visual book and I want the audience to be able to see some of the, the curation that you've done. Um, talk about how you've sectioned off this book into the four sections. Um, you had hybrid cities, zones of freedom, myth and memory, inner landscapes. Explain those four sections yeah. for us. I, I mean, so look, so, you know, there's one way you could do a book like this, which is geographically. That seems to be less interested in thinking about the potential thematic links uh, that, that Africa's, that photographers, both within Africa and actually within across the diaspora, um, are working. Um, so I divided the book thematically. Uh, one section, Hybrid Cities, looks really at the explorations of the uh, metropolitan environment, at the African city. The Africa's got something like, I think there's something like three or five, I think five cities in Africa, which are already called mega cities, i.e. cities with populations over 10 million. That's going to double in the next 50 years, at some point in the 21st century, Lagos is probably going to be the biggest city in the world. So these sites of, of change, of contestation, of population flows, it's really interesting how photographers uh, capture these very dynamic sites. In fact, uh, we can even, let's look, um, let's look at just one of these, for instance. So this is, um, this is a Nigerian photographer called Andrew S. Ibo, um, who has done this great project on, on Lagos. Uh, it's called Mutations. And what he does, you know, he photographs the urban environment in Lagos, but he also manages to find these great moments of visual poetry, of pattern and color and symmetry, where we see what's potentially, you know, a large sprawling, chaotic city rendered with sudden moments of acuteness and abrupt beauty. And I think that's that's what we see here. So he's got a great eye at being able to capture the city in those terms. Um, we go to another photographer like Guillaume Bon, who has traveled down the east coast of Africa for a project that he calls Mosquito Coast, where he looks at a number of different uh, countries along the, 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 the east coast of Africa, uh, countries which have survived through all sorts of different um, uh, kind of physical uh, hazards in terms of civil wars and uh, various forms of kind of deprivation. But he also creates these photos which have, again, nuance, beauty, this ability, I think, to capture environments which you could look at and feel that you don't want to look any more of them. You could look at and feel that, well, these are blight zones in some sense or other. He finds in there possibility and poetry. And I think both those photographers, as well as the other photographers uh, in that hybrid city section, I think speak to the almost infinite ways that you can look at the city and look at the city as this site of change and as a site of constant motion. Uh, what were the other, the other sections? We could, before we move on to the other yeah. sections, while we have these images up. Yeah. Um, so when we think about cities and when we think about mega yeah. cities, as you've, as you've stated, there is this, um, you know, there is beauty, right? There's an absolute beauty to the bustling and the movement yeah. of, um, of a major African city, um, which these photographers capture. But then there's also this like realist, there, there's realism to it too, which yeah. is like, you know, it isn't perfect and it isn't like these, you know, beautifully swept streets, right? Yeah. And there's this sort of like, um, 
it's a uh, it's like a duality to 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 the experience of being in a major city in Africa. Yeah. Lagos being this dynamic, dynamic, dynamic place, which Andrew just captures so wonderfully. Um, because you know, as as I know, he he sometimes is photographing even as he's sitting in traffic, right? You know, Lagos. Anybody who's been in Lagos traffic knows that you've got three hours. Andrew is finding beauty uh, in, in while he's sitting in traffic. What do you think about this duality of beauty and, and chaos and, 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 and what it means for contem the contemporary photographic lens of megacities? Well, I, I, think, I think you have to find a way, you have to find a way to hold that potential contradiction and certainly that tension within one image. I'm, you know, there's, there's a sort of popular narrative that's kind of promulgated in newspapers and elsewhere it talks about Africa rising, you know, rising mm -hmm. GDP, tech savvy younger generation. I'm kind of allergic to that <laughs> as a narrative because it seems to gloss over to me, you know, the real difficulties of just living on the ground and living in some of these cities. Uh, just the basic infrastructure challenges of getting around through traffic and so on and so on and so on. So what I, admire about someone like Andrew's uh, photography is that he doesn't present a glossed over uh, superficial view. He finds beauty through the awkwardness or the abruptness or the difficulties of the everyday. So just Absolutely. looking at this image, for instance, you know, look, if you're, you know, if you're in a number of different countries in Africa, you might find yourself in one of those, the, you know, this yellow minibus in the corner of the image, like in Ghana, we call those tro tro. Uh, mm -hmm. They're like, and you know, they're a conventional way for people to get around. You're sitting in this minibus with lots of other people. It's crowded, it's hot, it's cramped. Sometimes someone might have a goat with them or some other form of livestock. That's just part of the deal. You're in traffic for a long time. It's not glamorous, but at the same time as that, it's just another part of the reality. You can't, you can't shade it out or there's no need to shade it out. What you do or what potentially Andrew does clearly is find a way to recognize both that and look, set this against in this image, this backdrop, uh, this kind of modernist uh, architectural uh, kind of uh, design, gate design, wall design, whatever that is plus balance that against the guy coming in from the right with the yellow bag as well. So we get, you know, uh, and the woman in the middle with the, with the wraparound skirt. So these different forms of yellow that are patterning across the page as well as the pattern in the backdrop. That's a, such a great way of seeing. It's and, an amazing way of seeing. And, and, yeah. and one of the ways that like most photojournalists, I would say, Hope, hope to level their work up to, which is like, how do you blend uh, the aesthetic part of it, which is the symmetry, the rule of thirds, you know, all of those elements of lines, but also get the color right, but then also capture a moment. Yeah. Um, and Andrew yeah. is, is one of the best, I think, uh, his one of my favorite series that he's also done, speaking of the duality of the contemporaneness of, you know, or Africa rising, but also this is everyday life is he did this series, I don't know if you've seen, on nightlife in- uh, Oh, oh yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Like the most, it's, it's incredible because he goes from like the club on the corner on Saturday, you know, where like everybody's sweating and dancing yeah. and super close to not, you know, to weddings where people are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars yeah. and everything's yeah. sparkling and clean and pristine. But yeah. just again, the, the, the spectrum of experiences yeah. is, is, is I think what you are, you were looking to capture, which is yeah. not, it's not one or the other. It's, there's beauty exactly. in the spectrum, right? Exactly, exactly, exactly. And I'm so, cause I'm also struck. Anytime, you know, anytime I'm, I'm on the continent of Africa, you know, you get off the plane and you're met with the heat, it's kind of a variety of smells, it's a very intense sensory experience, but it's so intoxicating, mm. the entire experience. And I love the thing when, when, when I find photographers who capture some of that, um, some of this kind of spectrum mm. of sound and smell and visual impression, uh, some of the sensoriness of that. It's so exciting to me. It's so exciting to me to look at, you know. <laughs> it's so okay. good. 
All right, let's jump into right. Inner Landscapes, your yeah. second uh, chapter of the book. Um, right. No, actually, this is this is Zones of Freedom. We're in. Okay, let's talk about yeah. Zones of Freedom. Um, yeah. Zanelli Maholi, um, who South African photographer focused on LGBTQ rights, yeah. um, has used her work as actual activism. Um, yeah. Talk me through Zones of Freedom. Why that? Why that? So, I mean, Zones of Freedom as a section is is about looking at photographers who are looking at. I guess, uh, individual states of being and freedom. So that's uh, gender, so that's evocations or depictions or, or, of, of ways of looking at gender, ways of looking at sexuality, ways of looking at even at style. Uh, this in the context of a continent which has to some extent, and in some places very socially conservative views around gender sexual around identity. sexual identity exactly exactly and so we know another, that it's actually life or death for some people well so there's a number of countries in africa where um uh gay and and uh and lesbian uh same-sex uh activity is illegal yeah. in, in a minority of countries illegal and punishable by death so yeah. real world Situations, real world consequences for the simple from the simple for the simple expression of who you are. Uh, so Zanelle is one of the singular uh, artistic greats, uh, enormous kind of talent uh, coming from South Africa. And this series, this image here, is a series of self portraits that she's uh, that she's created, which uh, which depict her and actually something like seventy different. Uh, self-portraits, all of which are quite radically different, all of which are play with uh, representations of the self. Again, we think back to Samuel Fosso uh, a few decades earlier doing something similar. Her images, she deliberately, the, the kind of patina of the image gives her a deliberately darkened uh, skin tone here. So she's also playing with the colonial representations of Africanness hyper aware of all of these things and beyond these self-portraits she's also done you know as you all know these ongoing uh sets of portraits of queer people in south africa uh yeah she makes no division between her work as an artist her work as an activist and her work as a photographer who's actively working towards change in south africa change in africa change internationally around how we uh think about and represent and depict uh, LGBTI individuals. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, her work is really important. Her work is incredibly important and it's been just incredible to see her rise um, yeah. as, a, as a photographer uh, in the photo community, in the artistic community, because yeah. her work is no longer just seen as, you know, as photography, but it's like, it's, it's, art at this point right like well i mean i mean she's got she's got a solo show coming up at tape modern uh which was a, it's been delayed but it's later on this year i mean i'm sure i'm pretty sure that makes her perhaps is it i don't know well certainly the first african female photographer uh probably the first female you know number of firsts uh to have a, a mid-career solo show at tape modern and the work is extraordinary you know so yeah beauty, empathy, power, all sorts of things, deep conviction. Um, who else? Uh, oh, Ruth Say. Yep. So great, so great. Ruth Say uh, is a fashion, well, actually, I mean, her origins lie as a fashion photographer. She's based in, she's actually based in Yorkshire, uh, but she's uh, part British, uh, part Nigerian. This is such a great series that she did called Fine Boy No Pimples, which kind of, she kind of went back to the, um, the town that her family comes from in rural Nigeria. It's photographed, this photographed a, a set of young men, some of whom are friends, some of whom are family, uh, uh, dressed them up uh, kind of contemporary fashion with a great uh, fashion stylist called Ib Kamara, who she worked with on the project. You know, this young man, I think might be her cousin. I think he's wearing some of these clothes, the women's clothes, uh, you know, high heeled shoes. All this really is about a playing with, a contesting with some of the uh, hyper heterosexualized ideas of masculinity in somewhere like Nigeria and recognizing that for young men, uh, there's possibility to how you can articulate yourself. You don't have to work okay. within heteronormative boundaries. 
And again, playing with the duality of and looking across the spectrum, even within this one portrait, this one stage portrait with the yellow do rag, which is known to have masculine, uh, you know, tendencies. Yeah. Men men tend to wear them, but then also juxtaposed with the high heeled shoes and this this very feminine umbrella uh, with the backdrop uh, is is so powerful um, and playful and and really test the imagination of what is and what could be. Exactly, exactly. I mean, I, you know, I love her work because she managed, look, because all of, you know, so many of these photographers, they make it look apparently easy. You know, they make it look uh, so elegant in terms of their exploration of these ideas. But I know, for instance, that, you know, she's referencing, um, say, do um, Malik Sidibe, right. you know, who we talked about before. There'll right. be some sense of basically, you know, the lineage of studio portrait photographer in Africa and how. Re like really the I think the questions that someone like her is asking is how do you work within that lineage how do you find a way how do you find your space there but also how do you work against the lineage of ethnographic portraiture that comes from the west simultaneously and the answer that we see here is to confound that is to go beyond expectation to create a set of images here that are beguiling and dazzling on their own terms. It's so great, I think, anyway. It's amazing. All right, yeah. next. What do we got next? What have we got? Oh, okay. All right. So actually, let me just, I'll go to, let me go to this one, actually, out of these two. So myth look. This chapter uh, is myth and memory. So this actually myth and memory really is about uh, how photographers capture and work with, um, I guess, look, what you might call uh, African epistemologies, which is a long way around of just saying, how do you work with belief systems and knowledge systems that are indigenous to Africa? How do you work with traditional ideas of faith, belief, myth, memory, and so on? How do you work with the memory of, colon of a colonial past? How do you work with traditional folklore? How do you work with oral storytelling? How do you work with legend, myth, fantasy, all of these things? Lena Iris Victor, Liberian British photographer, uh, again, kind of extraordinary in her work, I think. She creates these fantastic, vivid self-portraits. Uh, this series looks at, it's kind of part of a series she's done that actually looks at the legacy of Liberia as a country and its relationship to America. So Liberia is, you know, colonized. Very close relationship. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it's a close and complicated relationship, but the series that, that she created, which this image is part of, looks in uh, kind of powerful, vivid and metaphorical detail at these linkages across time, across memory, across folklore. She creates her own visual mythos that speaks to those pasts. And she does so in these images that are actually fantastic. They're kind of, the, the surface of them as, as physical objects, they're kind of gilded with gold. So there's a thin of Viennese kind of uh, traditions. There's all sorts of tropes and elements that she's playing with in the images. Fantastically complicated, but also fantastic beguiling. And I think that the, the reference to history, when you start to peel back the layers, as you've said, and start speaking to these photographers as to what they were referencing and why they, they, they yeah. did their body of work, you're, you're learning again too about the history of, of Africa and its relationship to the West, right? And so many people don't recognize the relationship between Liberia and the United States and just how, how hand in hand they are, but the, the power of photography and the power of these photographers to use this sort of myth and mythicism to, to play in that space of history, right? And to yeah, exactly. explore that and to educate people in a new, in a new way. One of my, one of my really good friends yeah. um, and colleagues, uh, uh, Azu no, no, Nobugu. I'm not sure if you know him. He was the artistic director of Lagos Photo Festival. Oh yeah, yeah, of course I know. Yeah, he's yeah. fantastic. Um, he yeah. once said because uh, he he really thinks a lot about mysticism and in contemporary African photography that you know he was challenging challenging us on on the the use of photojournalism in Africa. And he said um, it's not that photographers aren't interested in photojournalism. But Africa has become sort of a playground for photographers coming to tell the truth about the continent. And they get yeah. stuck on this hopeless narrative. And he yeah. thinks that people can just sculpt so much more than this, right? Uh, what, are, what is your thinking around that? Exactly, exactly the same thing. 
Look, truth is relative as far as I'm concerned, certainly when it comes to photographic truths. Um, I'm interested in the photographers that embrace their relative position, that embrace their personal position, that are less interested in documentary in reportage and are more interested in individual sensibility. Look, if we move on just for a moment, look, uh, Yusuf Nabil, uh, who's an Egyptian born artist and photographer, uh, creates this, uh, this series. This, this, this image just to, to flag is in the, the fourth section of the book, Inner, Inner Landscapes. Yes, exactly, which very much is about how photographers conjure their own personal dreamscapes with Africa as a setting, Africa as a subject sometimes, Africa as, a, as, a, as an invitation to look further. So Yusuf Nabil does a series of, of portraits of, of him looking out across these different settings. This is, a, I think this photo is taken in Essaouira in Morocco. And each of these is about him dreaming aloud. Each of these is about these very romanticized, um, uh, images or, or of, of these sets of places that he goes to where uh, reality is conjured over as a dream state, as a place where he has a kind of personal investment, as a doorway to adventure or possibility or all sorts of states of being or belonging. We can see the same thing in a very different way it's a series by uh, Nubuku uh, Nkaba, uh, it's a South African photographer, who kind of works with these, she's done this whole series with, uh, with these bags. I love this series. Yeah. You know, look, everyone knows these bags, they're produced in China, they have all sorts of different names and all sorts of different places, but I think um, in South Africa, well, certainly she describes them as Ghana must go back, Actually, all, no, sorry, not South Africa, Nigeria, sorry, describes them as Ghana must go bags because they're the bags that perennially uh, migrants and travelers take from one place to another. You put your possessions in there and you go, and she's created this whole set of images which are represented by nothing but these bags. So these bags as, as signs of, of migrancy and, and of movement, but also these bags, also have a, a kind of personal uh, uh, relationship for her. They detail some of her own families going, uh, families movements back and forth. Actually now, now I'm, is she South African? I think, actually, sorry, yeah, ignore the Nigerian part, South African. So she's thinking about her own family's movements back and forth across the country. But again, internationally, we see these bags all over the world, you know. Everywhere. Uh, yeah. These bags as totems, really, actually, of, a, of an international underclass, to be perfectly honest, in as much as if you can't afford luxury luggage, you might end up with these. And as a marker, therefore, as dis of displacement, of movement, of forced exchange, but also exchange of commerce, exchange of possibilities that take place around the world. So just an enormous amount of... And, again, with her work wrapped up with a very personal relationship to these. And for me, this is what photography can do when it abandons an attempt towards a singular objectivity. You can end I, up with, you know. I love that. I love the idea of, of forgetting what, you know, the standards and, and creating a, a vision for the future. We could, I would, I so wish we could continue this conversation. Um, I'm, I'm so glad that we're close and we can now, we're now good friends and we will continue. Um, for, for anyone who um, is watching, please be sure to pick up uh, Echo's new beautiful book and you can dig into all 50 of the photographers that he has, uh, that he has talked about today, some in which we didn't get a chance to just because we're short on time. It is a beautiful body of work. Echo, thank you so much for your time today. Um, and for, for this for this work. Just wrapping up really quickly, I wanted to say that this year's festival program is free of charge for everyone and has been made possible by the generosity of supporters and donors. If you've enjoyed this event, we'd love for you to consider making a donation to the book festival so that they continue uh, to do the great work of putting on events for as many people as possible. Once again, my name is Whitney Richardson. You've been here with Echo Ekwa, and we are so happy to have had this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you.